Chinder. Welcome to Drum Talk TV. I'm here with my guest today, Mike Portnoy. He's on the Winery Dogs Tour. How you doing, Mike? I'm doing good. Great. Hey, let's start out with this. It's the second day of the tour here in Vegas. I got to ask, how's the tour going? Well, it's the second day in America, but, ah, that's right. but we've been on tour uh, since July, so August, September, a couple months now. Yeah. We already did Japan and South America and Europe, and now finally back home in the good old US of A and kicking off the American tour over the next month. What's the reception been like? It has been incredible. Off the hook. Um, I keep saying this in interviews, I hate to repeat myself, but in answer to your question, it's it's been probably the most well-received thing I've ever done, including Dream Theater. Uh, it, it's just been, uh, everybody seems to get it and like it and embrace it and support it. And the numbers have been great. The turnouts have been great. The, the critical and fan reaction has been great. So thank you. Well, that is great because what I was going to say is whoever wrote your PR release mastered it perfectly. What it says in their PR release is that most super groups, and people will look at this band with you, Billy and Richie, as a super, quote, super group, but most super groups are short-lived. They're made up of often some eclectic and esoteric, you know, identities in their playing or in people, whereas what you guys are doing really seems to appear to the masses. And to hear you talk about the reception like that, I think really validates that that's the way it's going. Would you agree? I guess so. I mean, I, I can't put my finger on why. I mean, the, the the thing I keep coming up with maybe is just because the style of music is very timeless. Uh, you know, everything I've done up till now has been like rooted in Prague, and Prague has a great audience, and I love it. And it's been such a big part of what I do, but it's also a selective audience. You know, people that there's a lot of people that love it, but there's also a lot of people that don't like 20 minute songs with a million on time signatures. Uh, where, hey, what's wrong with those people, by the way? Well, hey, I mean, I, I love that as much as anybody else, but I think what the Winery Dogs does is more song and vocal and hook and melody oriented. Uh, just, you know, good songs and good playing. So that's the sort of style that really is uh, universal. Yeah, and it's very accessible. If you folks have not checked it out, check it out. It's self-titled, the Winery Dogs. Do you have a favorite track that you like to, and maybe there's two different ones, that you look forward to playing more or one that you like listening to more? Uh, it's the stock answer, but it's really the God's honest truth. I mean, you can't pick a favorite song because they're, you know, they're all part of you. It's like picking a favorite child. That's yeah. the cliche, but it's, it's, the, it's the truth. Um, I mean, I love Elevate, the, the, the track, the album opener, which is also the concert opener. It's just a great way to come out of the gates, both on, on uh, the CD and on stage. And I love uh, the show closer and the album closer, Regret, which is the total opposite side, which right. I'm playing probably the most uh, restrained drumming I've ever played. I'm playing with, uh, you know, hot rods and very jazz feel and just total subtleties and dynamics. And, you know, that's, there's a certain satisfaction in that as well. You know, I, I hope you don't mind this analogy, but Elevate, to me, has a very blue collar feel, if you will. And I think a lot of the Winery Dogs music, even though it's diverse within its own styles, it just has so much more of a mass appeal. And it's very relevant, which I like too. I think it's what we were saying before, I, you know, uh, you know, Billy Sheen and I obviously are muso kind of players, you know, uh, but Richie, Richie's a real soulful artist, more of a singer-songwriter, amazing guitar player. He's got the technique and the chops, but he's really all about the song and delivering the song with soul and conviction. Um, so I think I think that's honestly Richie's voice and style that makes this all so uh, easy to swallow. You know, absolutely. I want to switch gears and talk a little bit of drumming starting with your influences. I think most people, you've been around so long, you've done so many interviews that most people know most of your influences. Obviously, Neil Peart, John Bonham, goes on and on, Bill Bruford, Alan White, blah, 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 blah. Name them. Keith, <laughs> Keith Moon's a big one. Yeah. My question is, who might not be on that list 
that even if they're not as much of an influence, and maybe that's why they're not on the list for whatever reason, what influence might surprise people who you still enjoy listening to? I would say two that come to mind would be um, Lars Ulrich, because he takes a beating in the drum community. Absolutely. And uh, and granted, you know, he's not technically the greatest drummer, and he'll be the first to admit it, but his, um, you know, when he came around 30 years ago, uh, he and Metallica changed music, or at least hard rock and heavy metal music. And uh, to me, that value can never be underestimated. So regardless of whether or not there's a million drummers out there that could play tighter and faster, to me, it's more about the, the overall package. You know, I judge drummers based on their personality, their package, what they bring to their band, more than technique. Uh, that's why I also love Ringo Starr and Keith Moon so much. So Lars would be the one answer. Another answer would be Phil Collins. I feel I think Phil Collins, I mean, Prague fans know how great a drummer he is. Right. But the general public view him as, you know, the guy that was the pop, the, guy. The pop guy from yeah. the 80s. Yeah. But the fact is, if you listen to Foxtrot and uh, Trick of the Tail and right. Lamb Lies Down on Brand X. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the drumming you know, back that he was doing back in the early to mid seventies was, was amazing progressive drumming. Yeah. I actually watched last night I watched the live video of the Selling England by the Pound tour with oh. Supper's Ready and all right. that. And it, it to me, maybe because I like it so much, to me that music is so timeless. Absolutely. Way ahead of its time when it came out in the early seventies and here it is forty years later. Is it's still amazing. Named Phil Collins. Yeah. Have, 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 having you just watched it last yeah, night absolutely yeah. so that's cool now morphing from there into your different drum kit setups and that's a whole other subject that often people criticize drummers for and, and i never understand why drummers criticize other drummers for anything it, it, it makes no sense to me at all they, they have drum envy man drum envy and drum kit envy sometimes exactly. my question regarding your different kits you know they're never all the same how much work goes into stylizing the kit for that music? Does the kit come first or does it come out of what happens in the studio or working on the music, jamming it through? You know, it's a good question uh, in terms of which comes first. I think usually going into a, a, a project or a band um, or a session, I know what I'm getting into and I know what I'm shooting for. I mean, you have to choose the kit first because you can't show up to a session and have nothing to play on and then choose the kit. <laughs> right. So, I, you know, anytime I do a session or a band or start something, I have I picture in my head what I want to play. Uh, and every time I've done a different album or a different band or a different session, I, I try to mix it up and do something different. I mean, I've gone from the massive kits, you know, with Dream Theater, that's kind of what I became known for. And, right. And I know I, you know, I, I know I got a lot of criticism for it as well, having the massive kits. But the reality is when I was a kid, you know, I would look at Modern Drummer Magazine the way that most normal kids would be looking at Playboy and Penthouse, looking at the drum kits and like, oh my God, I'd look at Neil Peart's kit and I would, like, I want a drum kit like that. So when I was in a position to actually have whatever I wanted, I went for the Mammoth kit and it suited Dream Theater's style. But after 25 years of that, I surely like to mix it up. And what I'm playing with the Winery Dogs now is a five-piece kit. I was going to say, when you showed up with that, did they go, w what's up? Well, well actually... <laughs> Uh, when me and Richie and Billy first got together, um, I just worked on, I, I, I didn't even bring a kit to the writing sessions because Richie had a kit in the studio. And he was like telling me, well, I got a kit here, but it's too small and it's blah, 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 it's falling apart. I was like, I don't care, we're just writing. So I get there and it was literally kick, snare, floor tom. It's, a, it's literally a three-piece yeah. kit. Kick, snare, floor tom, hi-hat, and ride. Yeah. And it was, it was like so freeing for me. I was gonna say, it was l musically liberating it, in a way, wasn't it, it? It made the music and the song like dictate everything and, and I had to adapt to it. And that was the first step in kind of w where I've gone with the Winery Dogs. And then after the writing sessions, I brought a kit in to actually do the album and that's the same setup I'm using on tour, which is right. a, a Bonham five piece. Right. But, um, you know, compared to what I always played with Dream Theater, this is the polar opposite. And people might look at it on paper, like seeing me behind the small drum set, it may seem weird to them, but if you come see one of these shows, it's so natural. I mean, I feel very comfortable, and I feel like, I feel like I'm really shutting up the naysayers. Right. You know, it's like, look, 
I don't need that big kit. I like that big kit. It's a form of expression, right. but it's not the only form of expression. And when I play on the five piece kit, I feel very natural. I don't lose any of my personality on stage and any of my, you know, my, my yeah. entire presentation is still the same. It's just kind of, you know, condensed. Right. And then, then to get back to the original question, there's been everything in between. Like with, with Adrenaline Mob and Avenged Sevenfold, I had a very big kit, not Dream Theater level, but still very big. And then with the more proggy stuff I do, like Transatlantic or Flying Colors or Neil Morse solo stuff, I have a, a more a more traditional single bass with a double pedal. You know, you, you hit it on the head, Mike, when you said a form of expression. The problem I've always had with people criticizing the size of kits is you never criticize a guitar player for having eight guitars. They have different sounds. It feels different to him for what he's going to sure. play or her. A piano has maybe 88 keys. You don't just show up with the two octaves you're going to use for that gig. Well, that, that's the thing. When I started playing the drum kit, I mean, I, I joke about it saying, uh, you know, the two things you could tell by the giant kit is A, I didn't pay for it, and B, I don't set it up. <laughs> you know, that's my old joke. But the reality is, you know, when I was in a position with Tama and Sabian to have whatever I wanted, I always felt like, more is more. I mean, yeah. why more not, textures, why more not tones. Have all these options, like an orchestra or a symphony or a choir. You simply have more timbers, more tones. Yeah, absolutely. And and then comparing again to what you're doing with Winery Dogs, it's that form of expression that suits the music, and that's why it works, I mean, which is I've great. Always, always been a drummer that plays for the song and for the band, first and foremost. Right. And you know, choosing the kit and the size of the kit is is hand in hand with with that approach you know playing for the music and right. when I pick a kit and when I decide what I'm going to play on an album or on a tour or on a song it's all about what's right for this band and for this music right where is the kit for Cygnus and the Sea Monsters and how did that kit develop is that kit like in your garage next to your ride along lawnmower and you jam on it every night what's the deal I have a I have a drum room at my house if you go online Sabian did a very cool video an upset thing in their obsessed series and we actually show my drum room and I've showed my drum room in my uh, in constant motion DVD but anyway I have a drum room at home and I have my uh, my Rush tribute kit signed by Neil by the way awesome but uh, I also have my my Keith Moon uh, tribute kit my John Bonham tribute kit and my Ringo Starr tribute kit I, I did four tribute bands and in each of those cases Tama made me replica kits good for them that's yeah cool. and I kept them and I have them in my drum room at home that's great and then uh, the guys who own Chromie you know who Chromie is the uh, fly-by-night tour kit that was Neil's um, they'll they want to know if you want to play it sometime they tote this thing around put wow. it on display at music stuff I'll give you their information that's cool. but um yeah well, that'd, that'd really be cool the, the the rush tribute kit that I had for my Cygnus uh, Cygnus and the Sea Monsters gig was was modeled after Neil when he was a Tama drummer and that was the that was the drum set that I fell in love with that was like the signals right know, drum set yep. that the the cherry red yep. uh, I guess it was Maybe a, a Tama superstar at the time, right before yeah, the Yeah, and Art it was star. the gold anodized hardware. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and exactly. So this kid I have is a replica, and I must give credit to uh, Victor Salazar at Vic's oh, Drum Shop. He's the one that actually put that together for me. That's yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Great. Um, when we talk about drums and the different styles, the diversity. This might sound like a silly question, but I got to ask: What do you work on, like? Do you work, are there things that you hear that you want to do your own version of? Are there things that you do that you want to polish up or e extrapolate certain parts of and make something new of? Like when you're alone and in your drum room, what do you do? You're not going to want to hear this. And this isn't the right answer to give in a drum interview. <laughs> but you just read the drumming magazines like they're Playboy? When I'm not playing, I don't want to play, and that makes sense. I, I mean, I, I feel bad saying that, but I'm 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 a 46 year old man with with a wife and two teenage children that I never get to see. I get and that. I, I have other interests, and I spend literally half of my life behind the drum kit on stage or in the studio. So when I'm not, I'm not, you know, don't shoot me down, but I'm not the Virgil Donati or or uh, you know Thomas Lang type. And God bless them for for doing that, right. doing that. But that's not me. I, you know, I'm a different person. I have found that drummers who do that, and myself included, I've done it, 
that departure creates some objectivity when you do sit down back at your kit. It builds in freshness. I don't know where else that freshness could come from if you don't do that. And I think people do it to different degrees. If you do it to an extreme, more power to you. It's working. It's great. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not um, obviously, I, I envy people that can do that. The fact that Neil Peart did that, uh, you know, 10, 15 years right. ago, he reinvented long that himself. I mean, that's amazing. I totally respect and admire that. But it's just not where my headspace is at at this point in my life and career. I have many other interests, many, many other things in my life, like my family, which right. gets so little of my time as it is, you know? How is your family? They're great. I, I haven't seen them in months. <laughs> <laughs> How's Max is playing, right? Max is, is great. He's 14. He's got a band called Next to None. And um, I've had them opening for me on, uh, you know, whenever we're playing locally. They've, they've opened for Adrenal Mob. They're opening for Winery Dogs later this month. And they're going to do my Progressive Nation cruise next February. Nice. So, yeah, I mean, he loves drumming. He's a... He's, he really reminds me of me when I was his age. That's great. Um, the, the big difference is kids today have so many distractions that w we didn't have. Yeah. You know, they have all the video games and yep. the internet and the YouTube and the, all, you know, when we were, you know, when I was a, his age back in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, I, I only had my drums, you know. Right. So it kept me more focused. You brought up YouTube. Um, what I like personally as a drummer, and I'm 50, about YouTube is we didn't have that 10 years ago, let alone 30 or 40. And guys I only heard of back then, I can now hear and watch like Max Roach and Lionel Hampton, Papa Joe Jones, those guys. Do you watch old videos on YouTube? Oh, yeah. Do you find new guys? Like, is there a new cat on the scene, Mike, that you could see getting a 20 year career because he's just doing something so exceptional right now? Anybody like oh, but that? I mean, there's amazing. There's so many kids. There's a like, for instance, there's this six-year-old kid Avery. I'm sure everybody's. Seen I him. interviewed him. Okay. Yeah, he's so, amazing. I mean, he's six years old, and he's you know, it's, he's doing things that I couldn't do until I was like 13 or 14. Uh, you know, you you, ha you see kids like that. There's this uh, girl drummer from Indonesia, JP uh, Milenix, who I've seen cover my stuff. Right. I've seen uh, Maytal Cohen. Uh, yeah. The, the, the She's going to be on our show. Yeah. So these are people that I've seen on YouTube. Uh, Steve Moore, the drummer at the wrong gig. You know. <laughs> yeah. uh, my favorite of all is, is Zoltan Cheney. Yes. Uh, who actually used to live here in Las Vegas. Yeah. He blows my mind. Yeah. Now you talk about a twenty-year career. I don't know if I don't know if you could do that for twenty years. Right. Because you, you'd end up in the hospital. I mean, but <laughs> he's the most physically entertaining drummer I've seen since Keith Moon. He there's, blows my there's mind. There's two other prodigies, and we have a prodigy series. We interviewed um, Alexi, who lives here in town. She's amazing. She might even be here tonight. Alexi's incredible. She's ten now. Wow. She won the eighteen and under category for Hit Like a Girl this year. And then there's a young man named uh, Austin Koenig, whose father is coming tonight to the show. I don't know if Austin's coming. He's nine, and he's been winning competitions since he was four. And you're his favorite drummer, by the way. Well, so say hi to Austin, please. Hey, Austin. How you doing? <laughs> now, s staying in the vein of music, switching from drumming a little bit, you've written lyrics before. If you don't mind, where does your material come from lyrically? Does it come from personal experience, the news? Do you read a lot? Ninety percent of it is straight out of my life, and that's the way it was uh, always. I, I think I've written twenty-something songs while with Dream Theater. Well, I mean, I co-wrote all the music, but uh, you know, all the times in Dream Theater, whenever I wrote lyrics, I wrote the vocal melodies and did a lot of the singing too. And it was like twenty-something songs, and I would say. Out of that 20 something 80 to 90 percent of them are straight out of my life i mean that's cool uh you know a change of seasons i wrote for my mom who was killed in a plane crash uh best of times i wrote for my dad and and presented it to him on his deathbed uh honor thy father was a situation in my life you know with a bad relationship i wrote five songs about my recovery from alcoholism um you know Good Night Kiss was written for my kids. Uh, with the Winery Dogs, I have a song called You Save Me, which I wrote for my wife. So in all, these, great. In all these cases, these yeah. are things, for me, it's always been a form of a therapeutic expression, mm -hmm. you know? Um, uh, and you get it off your chest process without laying on the couch in someone's office, basically. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the five songs I wrote about the 12 steps of recovery, I mean, that was like doing 12-step work right. for, my, yeah, for myself. You know, literally going through the 12 steps, getting it on paper, getting it out there. And then, you know, I, I have a lot of gratitude for the people that come to me saying, you know, that things like that have helped them and inspired right. them. And uh, 
you know, that's what it's all about. Um, that's what the 12th step is all about. And then you got people really. banging on a big drum kit concept. What's up with that? Those two polar opposites again. You know, you got people that are thanking you for a story that really inspired them, helped them through a hard time. And you got someone else criticizing you because of the size of your kit. What is that? I don't understand that. Well, I don't people, get that. Some people just, it's easy to its easy to criticize, and especially when you're in the safety of your, your parents' right. <laughs> basement on a computer. <laughs> Drinking the, off the top of the lava lamp, right? People, people that criticize, though, I think they're usually just they're just uh, making vague generalizations, and they probably don't even really know what they're talking about. Right? They don't know the whole story whatsoever. Yeah. 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 I mean, like those those headlines that you see on certain websites. Those are the headlines, but do people actually read the interview where that headline was taken right. from? Right. And the gossip and the BS of it, you know? Yeah. yeah. When you were in New Jersey for the Bonzo Bash this year, you were kind enough to get with Kenny Howard, who we really appreciate uh, you taking time to get with. And uh, he asked you a question. If you had one chance to ask John Bonham one question, what would it be? And you had a, you had a great question. You thought about it for a moment, it kind of stumped you. And you said heel or toe, because John, of course, had the most amazing flutter foot, I call it. Right. Um, and then you mentioned when we were talking earlier that you thought of another answer well, shortly was, after. Do you want to vocalize sure. that? Okay. I was put on the spot. That was a great question. Like, well, what, what, the question was what? If you could ask John and John Bonham anything today, what would it be, right? right. And I was totally put on the spot. I was like, hmm, what would I say? Like, I wanted to give a real answer. Like, what would I ask him? And heel up and heel down was a good one. But then I realized afterwards I, I should have, if, if John Bonham was here today, I'd say, hey, want to go to an AA meeting with me? <laughs> <laughs> a really good question. Maybe, maybe he would have been here today if yeah. uh, somebody asked him that back in the day. What do you think he'd be doing today? You know, people like him, Jimi Hendrix, that were so far ahead of their time and so relevant no matter what they did. What do you, do you think he'd be doing more of the yeah, same or I evolved? Or? I, I can't imagine. It's an amazing question. I mean, the ones that come to mind for me, obviously, are John Bonham and Keith Moon. Both of those guys are, you know, two of my top three drummers of all time. And it's like... What if? What what could have been? You know, they they both died so young. Uh, Randy Rhodes is another like you know having only made two albums with Ozzy. I mean, what could he what could he have done? Cliff Burton, the original bass player from Metallica. You know, it's sad, but you know people like that. You gotta appreciate appre you know appreciate talent while it's here. You never know yeah. when it's gonna be taken away. You know? Before we go, I want to do a um, Mike Portnoy fun fact. Um, I've heard that you're really into making film and video. Are you into doing short films and stuff like that? I, I'm, I'm a film fam fanatic. I can name any director of any film any year, any, uh, but I'm not so much a filmmaker. You know? okay. I think I, 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 I would be a great filmmaker if I had the patience and the time, but I don't know if I do. Right. I think I'd be a better film critic. I think I would be like doing what Roger Ebert used to do, watching films, analyzing films, talking about films. That's, right. that's my passion. Because right. I know you do the thing at the end of every year. You talk about your favorite film, your favorite mm -hmm. TV show, stuff like that. Now, when you say of every year, how far back do you go in your my film whole, anthology? My whole, my whole lifetime. Okay, cool. I have top 10 lists of every year since I've been born, since 67, uh, awesome. for film and, and uh, albums as well. That's great. You're probably like uh, my wife in the way of films where she'll watch a sh uh, movie from 1932, a butler will walk in for 15 seconds and she'll give me his whole movie career, everything he's ever been in. My, my, my love and uh, my fanaticism is mainly starting in my lifetime. I mean, I, I love some of the old stuff, obviously, you know, Citizen Kane and, and uh, all the Hitchcock stuff I love. But I get real fanboy stuff and film buff stuff starting from my lifetime, starting with Scorsese and Coppola and De Palma and, you know, late 60s stuff and then everything ever since. What's the one film you can't stop insisting people watch and will never get tired of watching? One film. Other than The Song Remains the Same. There's so <laughs> many. There's so many, but... I, it might be Boogie Nights, Paul Thomas Anderson's Boogie Nights. I mean, on paper, you think it's just some, uh, some crazy Mark Wahlberg film about a porn star, but man, it is one of the most well-made masterpieces of modern film, and, and as well as Magnolia, P.T. Anderson's follow-up. Love Magnolia, love Boogie Nights. Stanley Kubrick's my all-time hero, so, you know, Clockwork Orange, 2001, The Shining. Uh, I don't know. I, I can, we, yeah, I could do a whole, a whole other interview. I can absolutely do a whole other interview about film with we'll you. We'll do that sometime. And then for the fun fact, it'll be about drumming. 
Um, we'll talk about Gentle Giant or something. Mike, thanks so much for coming on Drum Talk That's TV. Awesome, really appreciate it. Really excited about seeing the show tonight, uh, which is great. Caught some of the sound check. Your kit sounds phenomenal. Wow. Props to Tama, Sabian. Yeah. Just everybody whose stuff you're using. Yep, there you go. The T. For yeah, life. There Tama you go. Sabian for life. <laughs> Very cool. No getting out now. <laughs> Come on again sometime. We'd love to have you. Anytime you have something to promote or anything, push it our way. We'll always awesome. push it out there. Thank and you. thank you. are welcome. And thank you, everybody, for joining us here on another episode of Drum Talk TV here with Mike Portnoy. And we'll see you soon. Keep watching. Oh, I can hook you up with a Sabian shirt, by the way. Really? Absolutely. <laughs> Keep watching. <laughs>